Word of God that we consider this morning is found in John 1, verse 42, omitting the first sentence and starting with the second. When Jesus beheld him, he said, Thou art Simon, the son of Jonah, thou shalt be called Cephas, which is by interpretation a stone. A man with more marked contrasts than Simon Peter is hard to be found in the scriptures. He was by nature a bold, impetuous man. He forced himself to the front of every situation and would be the leader if others would permit him. And yet the history of Peter as found in the scriptures is a history of a man who didn't always succeed in what he wanted, but failed at times. He was a man who would walk on water and then sink. He was a man who would say, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God, and be willing to stand alone to say it, and then in the courtyard of the high priest's house would deny Jesus three times. He was a man who would fight with the sword of the Spirit when he spoke the word of God and later with the sword of the flesh. Yet in Peter, beloved, we see ourselves. We see the contradictoriness of our own nature. We believe and we fail to believe. We obey and we disobey. We are strong and we are weak. What explains these contradictions? It is the reality that we experience in ourselves of an old man and a new man. There is in us by nature the old man of sin. That man which can only sin. And then there is in us by grace the new man that is Jesus Christ our Lord himself who lives within us. And that alone explains Peter's confessions and obedience and strength. In our text, Jesus draws explicit attention to this twofold character of Peter, and that as a way of instructing us also about the two men that live within us, the old and the new. <coughs> this is not only the first time we meet Peter in our text, but it is also the first prophetic word of our Lord and Savior at least as recorded in the Gospel according to John. And in this prophetic word to Peter, Jesus speaks of who Peter was by nature and who he would be by grace, and as much as he speaks of Peter's old name, thou art Simon the son of Jonah, and his new name, thou shalt be called Cephas. The gospel as it comes out of our text this morning will help us put our own contradictoriness into perspective and will encourage the sinner as we see our sins, our weaknesses, our failures, and our unbelief by reminding us that God continues His work of grace in us to make us a saint and to bring us to glory there where we will be sinless. I call your attention to our text under the theme, Simon's New Name. Notice first his old and new names contrasted. Second, his new name prophesied. And finally, his reception of grace assured. Jesus clearly brings out a contrast between Peter's old and new name. Thou art this on the one hand, and thou shalt be that on the other. Two different things. He was Simon. The word means hearing. Why it is significant, or if it is significant at all, we do not know. Did his parents have reason to name him this? We do not know. But on the eighth day of his life, when he was brought to the temple 
when he was circumcised, rather, he was given the name Simon, and up until this point in his life, that's the only name by which he had been known. But he would be Cephas, Peter. That is significant. When God gives somebody a name, he does so with purpose. John underscores that when he tells us just what that name means. Thou shalt be called Cephas. That's the, uh, the Hebrew word, which is by interpretation a stone. He underscores the meaning of the name as if to say there's a reason why Peter must be named this. We all know what a stone or a rock is. Not the size of the stone matters now, whether it be a huge rock or a pebble, but the fact that a stone is something that is almost unchanging. Almost, I say, because as a creature it does and must change, but changes so slowly over the course of history that change is hardly noticeable in it. A stone, the sort of thing on which you can build a house. A stone, the sort of thing you can use if need be as a weapon because it is hard and firm. Peter will be a rock, unchanging, firm, steadfast. But Jesus means to underscore that deeper contrast, not just in the names, but in the identity of Peter himself. <clears throat> On the one hand, by nature, he is Simon, the son of Jonah. The Lord speaks in our text of his natural condition and status. What does he say of it? In the first place when he says, Thou art Simon the son of Jonah, he means to underscore that socially, this Simon was a nobody. We don't know anything of this Jonah. We don't know the ancestry of Peter. We don't need to. It isn't all important. Some in Jesus' day knew of it, but for us, it makes no difference except to underscore that Peter is as good as a nobody. He is one among many. He is one in the mass of humanity. And so it is, of course, with you and I. Perhaps here or there, one who is called by the gospel and converted can claim nobility in his parentage or some other claim to greatness as men regard greatness. And yet, the Apostle teaches in 1 Corinthians 1 that the Lord calls the base and the lowly and the foolish of nobodies. He will build His kingdom and His church. In the second place, our Lord draws attention to Peter's spiritual status when he says the son of Jonah. Whenever our parentage is pointed out, what's underscored is that we are men. We are humans. Humans descended from this father and that, he from that, and he from that, all the way back to Adam, and therefore a reminder that we, with all mankind, are under the guilt and curse of sin. Simon, Jesus is as much as saying to him, you are but a sinner. You need me, the Christ and the Savior. And how much is that true of us as well? We all acknowledge it, admit it at appropriate times, and yet want to forget that we are sinners. 
Not merely that we have sin here and there, but that sin is a matter of our nature, and that this nature has been passed from father to son, so that we've got it from our parents, and will certainly pass it on to our children, and that there is no mere human who can deliver us from the bondage, corruption, and guilt of sin itself. And then, in some way, when, the, when our Lord says of Peter, Thou art Simon, the son of Jonah, He means to underscore that also because you are a man, you have your characteristic weaknesses. Peter was an impetuous man, a bold man, impatient and zealous. And you understand that when you put impatience and zeal together, an impatience and a zeal that's not governed by wisdom and a desire for the glory of God, you often have sin as an effect. It's not wrong to be zealous. That's not a sin. It's not wrong to have firm convictions as to what must be done, so long as those convictions are based on the Scriptures. And it's not wrong to voice them. But when one is so eager to act and has not first thought of how to act in a way that will bring honor to God, sin will be the result. Such was Peter. He was not always seeking God's glory and ready to do things God's way. It was Peter's way. And so with you and I. Whether it be impatience, whether it be an unguided zeal, or whether it be something else, every one of us has, in addition to sin in general, some specific personality trait and character trait that when not governed by the grace of God and put in the service of God, leads us to sin and to seek ourselves. But what a striking contrast between Simon, the son of Jonas, and the man whom he would become, Cephas. What a contrast between one who is impatient, zealous, seeking himself, always ready to act first and think later, and the man whom God will make him to be a rock, stable, firm, reliable. Peter will not be a different person, you see. He will remain the same person. Thou art Simon. Thou shalt be called Cephas. Same person. He will not be given a different nature. He will remain the son of Jonas. But he will be changed inwardly and renewed so effectively and so strikingly that he will act differently and others will notice. God takes men, women, and children such as we are, weak, sinful, by nature dead, unfit for his kingdom, and He changes us. When He changes us, He doesn't give us a different personality. <clears throat> he doesn't make us somebody who we were not before by nature. But He works His grace in our heart so that all of the natural gifts and talents that we once had and used in our own service, we use in the service of of his kingdom. There is, in a broad sense, an application of the very words of the text to every one of us. We too shall be stones. That's the word of the apostle himself. Now, Peter, that apostle, inspired in 1 Peter 2, verse 5, 
when he says of the believing members of the church, you are lively stones in the temple of God. There is a sense in which Jehovah gives to every one of his children the firmness to use our gifts to his glory. The perseverance so that when confessing his faith and then opposed for it, we persevere in it. What a contrast between who we are by nature and what he makes us be by grace. This prophecy of a new name then was a prophecy of Peter's own personal salvation. And we find a twofold significance for Peter himself in this. In the first place, Jesus is teaching Peter that Peter will be made like unto God himself. I don't mean exactly as God. I don't mean equal with God. You understand that. But remaining a creature, Peter will be given a sense, or let me put it this way, God will work in Peter some of the glory of God Himself. And I say that because Scripture says of God that He is the rock. Deuteronomy 32 verse 4. He is the rock. His work is perfect. For all His ways are judgment. A God of truth and without iniquity. Just and right is He. And Psalm 18 verse 31. For who is God save the Lord? Or who is a rock save our God? There is, we say earlier, a rock that is higher than we are. You can try to find your stability on the rockiest mountain or outcropping. But until you find it in Jehovah God, you will not find true firmness and a good foundation on which to live and base your faith. Jehovah is the rock because He is Jehovah, unchanging from eternity to eternity the same. He is Jehovah and the rock as He shows and he shows that particularly in the saving of his church. On his work and on his word, his church is founded. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against her. Because she's built on a rock. The foundation, the confession that Peter made. Thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Indeed, in Jesus Christ Himself as our Savior, Jehovah shows Himself to be the rock. For what He promised to Adam and to the people of old, He fulfilled in sending Jesus Christ into our flesh. A man now, truly a man, and yet not one of whom it could really be said, the son of Joseph. Joseph, of course, raised him as his son. Legally, he was his father, but not as to his very being. And therefore, God showed himself the rock in sending his own only begotten son into our flesh, taking our nature upon himself to obtain salvation for us. And that very Savior says now to Peter in our text, you will be made a rock like God. The word or the term, the image of God is not used in the text, but this is exactly the reality which the text is pointing us to. Man was created in the likeness of Jehovah God Himself. True knowledge, righteousness, and holiness. Those gifts may have lost completely in the, his fall into sin. So that by nature we resemble the devil in every way. Unholy, unrighteous, and knowing evil and loving that evil that we know. The saving work of God 
is not only to teach us about him, but to make us again to be like him in a creaturely and limited way, admittedly, but nevertheless, truly possessing the glory of God himself. That first as regards the significance of this new name for Peter. In the second place, our Lord was certainly looking toward heaven and the place that Peter would have there. There when the body of Jesus Christ is made perfect, every member of the body has his own unique place. True already now, but we'll see it more fully there. There will be not two exactly alike. I said earlier, there's some general application here to us. We are all stones in the body of Christ, and yet there's something about Peter that must be different. I cannot tell you exactly what it is. It will be Peter as he is in glory serving Jehovah God. Shall be. Thou shalt be called. Of course there was fulfillment of that prophecy throughout Peter's life on earth. Most of the apostles and disciples from then on called him Peter. Jesus interestingly, often used the name Simon, even after this prophecy, as if continually to say to him, you aren't completely Peter yet. <coughs> Don't forget who you are by nature. Don't forget about your weaknesses now. Continue to look for grace. Jesus has heaven in mind. And we're reminded that everything that happens to us in this life, both in God's providence, but also every grace He gives us, has as its goal to shape, form, and fit us for service and glory. Then that has significance for us. The prophecy of Peter's new name is a prophecy of our own salvation too. We too shall have a new name. We have our names now. We are a Beth, or a William, a John, or a Susan, or an Amy, or a Lauren, on earth. And think to ourselves, why in heaven can we not have that name? And the answer of the Lord is, because Jehovah has another name for us there. I refer to what Jesus Himself says in Revelation 2, verse 17. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth it. A new name each one having a name different from the other, so that there will not be two Williams and two Johns and two Peters in heaven. A new name expressing who and what God has made us to be in the body of Jesus Christ. We don't know that name yet. God does. It's by that name that we are written in the Lamb's book of life from all eternity. It was that name that Jesus Christ knew as He went to the cross for His sheep, whom He calls and knows by name, and laid down His life. It is that name that we will know when we are brought to glory. Jesus prophesies here in the very act of speaking, as well as in the carrying out and the fulfilling of the prophecy, he shows himself to be the Messiah, the Savior. There is in the first place the fact that he speaks of that which is future. I have no authority, let alone any knowledge of the future, to walk up to you and to say, this is what's true of you today, 
And that is what we tr will be true of you in the future. How can Jesus then walk up to Peter and say this? <coughs> well, the answer is, of course, that he is the Son of God. And as the Son of God, knowing all things, the Messiah. That, of course, has come out of the text. The context, rather. The whole context of our text is that of John pointing out Jesus as the promised Lamb of God, and of Jesus beginning His work on earth by calling His and gathering His disciples. He gathers Andrew, Simon's brother, and then Simon, and then Philip, and Nathaniel. Jesus is beginning to manifest Himself as the Christ, the Messiah. It's in carrying out that office that he speaks to Peter, as he does in our text. <coughs> Jesus, to underscore something of that to Peter, beheld him first. And when Jesus beheld him, he said, that beholding wasn't a mere looking at, a mere glance, a mere looking his way. That beholding of Peter was a studied, insightful, observant, and penetrating look. For Jesus saw not only Peter as he was outwardly, but in that moment he saw Peter as he would become. And he could speak as a prophet. But not only does Jesus appear in our text as a prophet, he appears also as priest. For it is on the basis of his own priestly work that the very prophecy can be given to Peter and will be fulfilled. How can the sinner become a saint? That's the question. How can I, dead in sin and trespasses, become alive? And then once made a saint, how can I, who am yet beset by so much sin in this life, be glorified one day and made sinless? Can I do that for myself? Can I do that for you or you for me? We know it cannot be. It is the work of the grace of God in us. But on what basis this grace? The basis of the sacrifice of Him who is the Lamb of God on the basis of the death of Jesus Christ, our Lord. It's because Jesus spoke as prophet and would lay down His own life on the cross to realize this prophecy in bringing Peter to glory. That there is in these words an assurance to Peter that he will receive the grace of God. And now we ask the question, what kind of grace does it take? What kind of grace does it take to make a sinner into a saint? What kind of grace does it take to make a wimpy man, a worm, David said, into a rock? Very clearly, it's a sovereign grace. A grace that only God possesses. A power that changes the very heart of man. Very clearly, it's an irresistible grace. Not, Peter, God would like to make you, uh, Simon rather, God would like to make you into Cephas. Do you mind and are you willing? But thou shalt be called Cephas. What grace God bestows on us. This is a grace to become a rock. And that work of becoming a rock 
involves the grace of regeneration, the implanting of the life of Jesus Christ in us, and the grace of working faith, by which I mean the uniting of us to Jesus Christ by the bond which is faith. Then, the grace to become a rock involves the grace of sanctification. That especially is the grace that's on the foreground here. Regeneration, sanctification, and glorification, if we could isolate three of them particularly. Sanctification whereby God works in the heart of a sinner more and more progressively throughout our life to deliver us from the dominion of sin and to bring us under bondage and yoke of Jesus Christ and the law of God. That grace of sanctification is an amazing grace. They all are, of course. But this one in particular doesn't just operate on a man's outward actions, so that whereas before he would outwardly disobey, now he will outwardly obey. It doesn't treat man as if he were a puppet, so that God pulls strings and man does exactly what God wanted him to do. This grace of sanctification that changes a sinner into a saint is a grace that changes the heart of man and the soul of man so that we think and we will, we purpose, we plan, we choose all in accordance with the will and law of God. And it's a grace which God preserves in us until the point that He glorifies us. Preserving us because of being our nature always to revert back to sin. He must keep us in the way that leads to heaven. And then glorifying us because there is no man or woman, not even a saint in this life who can say I can bring myself now to heaven. I have had enough grace. I have had a good start from God. And now I can climb the last rung of the ladder. But a grace God gives that takes our sin away. Grace to become a rock. Then grace to be and live as that rock. For God's grace not only works in us, but through us. By which I mean that when one is a rock, one will, by the grace of God, live and speak that way. That confronts us with the question, do we? We hear of the grace of God. We confess the grace of God here together as a body. And then do we in our homes? throughout the week? And do we to our co-workers and neighbors as opportunity presents itself? When they say to us with something of scorn on their lips, you're not a, a Christian now, are you? And especially not a Reformed or Protestant Christian, are you? Do we say, I am? The sainthood of which we speak, this idea that God has given us grace and delivered us from sin's bondage, is that evident in our life? Are we living as the rocks, as the saints God has made us to be? God give us that grace. He assures Peter, that he would do that very thing. And he assures Peter of it as he says, As the Messiah, thou shalt be called. See this. The work God has intended for you to do, he will surely accomplish. The work he began in you he will surely continue to the end. Were he not to continue that work to the end and accomplish it to the end, he would never have sent his son into the flesh to start with. 
And Christ would never have singled out His disciples and would never have gone to the death of the cross and would never have risen again the third day. But His having done all those things is the assurance to Peter as it is to us as well that God will make sinners saints and glorify those saints at length. Thou art Simon, the son of Jonah. Thou shalt be called Cephas. That is God's word also to us this morning. Amen.